Thank you very much. So, first of all, uh, thank you very much to the Central Bank of Chile for the invitation, to the staff of the Statistics Department, and of course to Gloria Peña. And congratulations, because I think the event is very successful. Um, I hope it will continue. Um, so, I will focus today on uh, financial globalization, and I will highlight the importance of financial globalization. I will look at what we are doing in terms of data. Uh, I will show some examples uh, that we are already able to assess better what's going on. But then I will also make the point that we need to also have a kind of uh, revolution in thinking. And uh, I will explain what we are doing in Basel and I will provide some examples. So let's start with um, basic things. But the crisis really was a wake-up call. To, uh, we need to understand globalization. And I have a few key aspects I wanted to highlight. First, obviously, the financial institutions, they are global. Second, what is very important is that there are cross-border and cross-sector spillovers. So the links are very important across countries and across sectors. Um, third, it's very important to look at global assets and global liabilities, not just country by country, because there are links between the prices of assets at the global level. And lastly, domestic policies, they have implications globally. Uh, it's true for monetary spillover, so when you set policy rates in one country, can have implications elsewhere. It's true, obviously, for supervision, for banking supervision. So the bank is supervised by the home uh, supervisor, but this has implications for the host countries. And it's also true for fiscal issues. Um, for example, when you have a um, fiscal uh, program in one country that is very big, you can have implications in terms of the, pr the level of interest rates globally. So this is obvious, but it's really true for financial globalization, um, which has been going up uh, over the past three decades, even more than trade globalization that we were mentioning. Uh, why? Um, three main elements. First, um, when you have globalization of the production, you need to um, finance cross-border trade. You need to settle the transactions. So that's the first reason. The second thing is what we just mentioned, the global value chain. The more you have a global value chain that is separated across countries, the more you have to finance each of the steps. So if you only export from one country to another one, you have to settle the transactions. If you export through several countries, you have to settle the transactions in many places. And the last thing is that we also have seen a need to manage balance sheet at a global level. And this is of use for financial institutions, but also for corporate groups, and sometimes also for, for households. And in fact, uh, our numbers show that financial globalization has been much more rapid recently than trade globalization. So in these graphs, you see rapidly on the left that there is a positive relationship between financial openness and trade openness. In the center, you have a positive relationship between financial openness and GDP per capita. And the graph on the right shows you um, the ratio of financial openness to trade openness. And you see clearly that the ratio has been going up. So in other terms, while already we have said trade globalization has been going up, but financial globalization has been going up even more. Um, one caveat is that it's mainly, it's true for all countries, on average, but it's mainly true for advanced economies. You see the red line has gone up much more rapidly than the blue line, which is for emerging market economies. Um, we like to have a long-term view at the BIS, so we, we try to manage the statistics. And this is the same graph, but seen from uh, almost 200 years. Um, so you, you, you have the financial assets and liabilities in red, so the, uh, an indicator of financial globalization, financial openness, and you have the trade openness in blue. And you can see two main things. First, uh, the blue line, uh, we see that trade globalization, trade openness, is significantly above what we observed in the first wave uh, at the beginning of the, of the 20th century. Um, the second thing that you can see is that the red line uh, is significantly higher. And really, something has happened over the past uh, two to three decades. 
And then if you look closely, uh, you see that the red line at the end is stabilizing, or even you could say going down. And this is all what we hear in the press of people are saying that there is a peak in globalization, uh, perhaps not so much in trade globalization, but in financial globalization. And I would like to discuss a little bit more of this today. Um, but before that, um, we, we need to have more data. To understand better go what's going on, we need to have more data. It was uh, very well explained yesterday by the presentation by the IMF. Um, basically, the global uh, initiative, the Data Gaps Initiative, will help us to have a lot of data to address these issues. And I would like to make the point that already we have made a lot of progress at the macro and the micro level. Let me provide a few examples. Uh, at the micro level, um, over the past decade, we have set up a global hub where we can have information on large global systemic in financial institutions. So it's located at the BIS. Uh, it has taken almost 10 years. We will start the collection uh, right now and we will be able to provide information in 2018. So 10 years to collect data on global systemic financial institutions. But we are there. Um, sorry. Second example, um, we, with all these new data collections that we have set up since the crisis, we now have, um, for all countries and all regions in the world, a, a good understanding of cross-border flows. So, for example, here I, uh, I provide indicators that we publish at the BIS. Uh, believe me, so in red it's domestic bank credit, in blue it's cross-border bank credit. Why is it important to have this information on a consistent way for all countries? Is because we have seen that each time you have a financial crisis, it's uh, because you have a financial bubble before, and this is exacerbated by uh, cross-border flows. So the domestic flows, the red one, which is big, um, they are normally more stable. What is really providing f um, the, the momentum when you have a financial excesses is a cross-border component of credit. So this is very important to monitor, and now we have the data to do this. Um, a third example, of course, uh, the crisis was a crisis that was due to leverage. So, and we know that after such financial crisis, we will have several years, perhaps several decades, of deleveraging. So really, understanding what's going on in terms of leverage in the economy is important. Now we have data that where you can compare leverage for across countries and also across sectors. Uh, I've put two examples here uh, for emerging market economies and for advanced economies by sector, uh, private, public. This kind of graph, 10 years ago, we would not have been able to produce. Now we have the data and we can monitor what's going on. And by the way, if you see uh, the lines, the total lines in red, you see that almost 10 years after the crisis, we still have much more leverage in the global economies than before, which is interesting. Um, the last achievement is that um, we, we have a better understanding also of the role of international currencies. So here I plot um, what, we have, uh, what we produce on a regular basis for the major international currencies and by regions. But here it's for the global economy and it's only for the dollar. And I'm just looking at the glo um, global credit in dollar to non-US residents. The idea is that when something happens to the monetary policy in the US, it will have implications for these non-residents that are borrowing in dollars. Uh, in red, you have the banking credit. In blue, you have um, the, 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 the debt financing in dollars for the non-residents. And as you can see, it has been up quite significantly. Um, it's more than 10 trillions of dollars. Of course, it can be very interesting when you think that some, somehow we will have some kind of normalization in monetary policy rate, for example, in, in the US, it will have implications for these uh, non-residents outside of the US. So a lot has been done. But nevertheless, we consider that we, we need to have also uh, a change in, in, in the way we think the global economy. Uh, we have said uh, over the two days, it's very important to understand the role played by global companies. Uh, the problem is that when you use country statistics, you, you cannot, by definition, look at the activities of national groups outside of your economy. And this is particularly true for the financial sector, because banks, for example, global banks, they, have, they rely a lot on foreign branches, foreign subsidiaries. 
Um, the second thing is that um, uh, these banks, for example, or financial institutions, they not only have cross-border uh, claims, so from country A to country B, but they also are exposed to country B because they have affiliates in country B. Okay? So this is the importance of the local claims that you don't see in balance of payments uh, statistics. So our idea, and uh, this, I, I'm quoting this from a report that was done by uh, um, all the main international organizations in the context of the AIG. So we, have, we, have, we had a report looking at how to look at, uh, at this issue. And to simplify, uh, our, we have a, an horizontal approach right now, the residency-based view, where we look at domestic institutional units and foreign units in one country. The idea is to complement this approach with a vertical approach in dark, where you look only at the domestic institutional units, you don't look at the foreign units, but you add the foreign affiliates. And you look at this consolidated view of the economy, we can call it nationality-based, uh, or globally, uh, or consolidated. Um, and we think that it can be very helpful to better understand the functioning of the global economy, and at least for us at the BS, the global financial system. Uh, why? Because it helps us to understand who is taking the underlying economic decisions. In the case of Ireland, yesterday we said, well, we have IPP going from uh, one country like UK to Ireland. But who is really deciding this shift? For, uh, um, the second thing is, who is supporting the final risk? If things go wrong, who is supporting the risk? Which bank, for example, but also which corporate group will be affected? Um, and also, in which country resides the ultimately responsible unit? So, w at the end of the day, someone will have to pay, for example, and the taxpayer, uh, for example, in the case of Ireland, there was a problem, and at the end of the day, the taxpayer from Germany was paying for the, for the issue. So, we, we really think that these nationality-based data sets can complement the residency-based statistics, um, but for this, you need to have information on the residency basis complemented by information on a group basis. And we think that because we have these new data opportunities, the big data, the large administrative data sets, we can construct such information, and I will show some examples. But before that, you need to, it's a bit complicated, because you need to have um, an approach of what is a group. And there are different definitions, uh, from the statistical world, from the business accounting, from the supervisory world. Then you need to have uh, to define what is the group, uh, and what, at what level you want to have the information. This was a profiling exercise you, you mentioned yesterday. Uh, so you really need to define uh, how you, what you mean by control. Uh, you need to define what you mean by your corporate group. And then you have to do the, the classification. So you have to reallocate units from one country of residency to one nationality. So you have to assign a home country to each of the groups. And you need to look through the chain of controls. You need to identify, and sometimes it's very opaque. It's very difficult to do that, as we heard yesterday for, for the UK, for example. Um, so it's a simplified uh, graph, but it shows that it's not so easy. Because you have the institutional units above. On the left, you have the SNA approach, based, in fact, on the, on the concept of um, residency. So by definition, you cannot aggregate units that are not resident. So you cannot have a, a view of the global group. Uh, in addition, and this is the second problem with the SNA, you, you are not supposed to consoli consolidate. So you, you, you will not consolidate um, different entities within a group because you will have the inter-office operations. So on the right, we have uh, more the corporate group approach where you look at the concept of control. The idea is to aggregate the units, both locally and uh, foreign, uh, uh, foreign units that are owned by the, the domestic units. Uh, and you also have to consolidate. You have to get rid of the inter-office positions. Uh, but even here, it's complicated. It's not so easy. So you have, the, um, on extreme right, you have the, bro the broad uh, view of a group, which is a business accounting view. Uh, 
where you mix everything. Um, in the middle, you have the, the supervisory view of a group where you, you focus on specific functions. So, for example, for banks, um, you will not have uh, insurance activities. So, if you have a group that is made of banking activities and insurance activities, you will not include the insurance activities. So, um, so it's yeah, the, the devil is in the details, and it's not so easy to do this, uh, these calculations. Nevertheless, I would like to, to make the point that it can be useful. And I will provide a few examples. Um, one is, um, there was a lot of attention at some point of exposures of national banking systems on Russia. It could be on another country, but basically there was a lot of attention at the policy level on, uh, uh, in the mid, um, well, a few years ago, on the exposures of national banking systems. And what I plot here is, all what we call foreign claims in blue. So basically, these are all the claims, the exposures of the national banking systems of France, Italy, United States, on Russia. Uh, can be cross-border or can be through the local claims that are uh, given in Russia by the affiliates of the national banks. Um, so, and these local claims are in red. So you clearly see that if, for example, you compare United Kingdom and Italy, if you only look at, uh, if you look at total claims, the exposure of Italy is very high. If you look only at cross-border claims, meaning you don't look at the local claims of the affiliates, meaning you don't look at the red, you only look at the blue minus the red, then you would say, well, the exposure of the Italian national banks on Russia is very small compared to United Kingdom which would not be true. So it's a good, good example that if you want to really to have uh, a good view of your exposure to a given country, you need to have this from a consolidated perspective, including the claims of your affiliates in a specific economy. A second example that we have, so we publish at the BIS International Debt Securities for all countries in the world, most, and um, we, we publish this on a residency basis and also on a nationality basis. So basically what we do is, loan by lo um, securities by security, we reallocate from a residency to a nationality uh, concept. And here I plotted uh, three countries. Uh, you, if you look at Brazil, for example, so you have the, the, the US credit to non-banks in Brazil, so um, uh, residents in Brazil, and if you look at uh, the red, you have the bank credit. If you look at the light green, you have the debt issuance of the residents in Brazil. And then the dark green is uh, the debt issuance of Brazilian companies, but not from the residents, from their affiliates outside. So basically what it means is that if you look at uh, the debt issuance of Brazilian corporates, uh, you will miss the dark green, so it's, it's a and it's a large amount of the exposure of uh, Brazilian corporates. Um, if you look at Turkey on the on, on the right, then you see that most of the exposure is onshore. So uh, the, the, the issuance of debt is made by residents from Turkey. It's very difficult for corporates in Turkey to go outside and issue debt. So the situation is different from one country to another one, and the assessment of the fragilities is different. In the case of China, we see that um, in recent years, there has been a huge expansion of, uh, of uh, offshore issuance, so by non-resident Chinese, so meaning that in the traditional residency-based statistic, you will not capture this exposure. And, um, and then, because you have granular information, you can dig further and you can understand who is really taking this risk. In this case, it is mainly property developers uh, that, are, uh, that have been expanding a lot in terms of um, foreign exposures uh, uh, in China. Uh, a last example that we, we analyzed in, um, in the annual report of the BIS uh, this year, and also I'm coming back to what I said on peak globalization. So we, we, we looked at the data we have to better understand what's going on with this, uh, the, uh, the appearance of peak globalization in finance. And uh, in fact, so when you look at uh, asset and liabilities at the global level, the, the stabilization of the red line I mentioned at the beginning is mainly due to cross-border banking activities. 
Okay? So it's really the, the, the banking component of international uh, capital flows that has been going down. And when we look our, at our statistics on uh, banking statistics, uh, on, the, on the left, the locational uh, banking statistics, you clearly see that it, it has been going down from 60% of GDP to below 40% of GDP. So it's a huge fall in terms of uh, international bank uh, flows. The international banking statistics of BIS are presented in two ways. On a residency basis, which is a locational, but also on a consolidated basis. And I will try to explain how it's useful to understand what has been going on in terms of this apparent peak globalization. So, on the left, you have on a residency basis a sharp fall in cross-border banking activities. Uh, in the middle panel, we look at the consolidated bank claims. There are two big differences between the, the left and the middle panel. One is that we exclude uh, inter-office positions. So we consolidate at the level of each uh, banks their operations. And the second thing, um, so first to finish on, on this, so we consolidate, so we get rid of the inter-office position. So inter-office position on the left panel is what is in blue, which is, believe me, the thing that has been going down, uh, going, uh, down the most. So in fact, when you look at on a consolidated basis, you get rid of this adjustment of inter-office positions. So a very important part of the retrenchment, of the decline in banking, cross-border banking activities was simply due to consolidation at the group levels. The second difference between the left panel and the, and the middle panel is that it uh, includes the local claims. So it's not just the cross-border claims of banks, so vis-à-vis -vis another country, it also includes the local claims of their affiliates, which are consolidated in the national banking groups. And as you can see, the local claims in local currency are in green, the local claims in non-local currency are in brown, and they have been much more stable. So the exposures of banking systems through their local affiliates has been much more stable than the cross-border exposures of uh, national uh, banking systems. Nevertheless, even in the consolidated foreign bank claims, you see a decline. So let me turn to the third panel, where we have the same information, uh, but by nationality of the banks. And you clearly see that what has been going down is the blue, uh, meaning the euro area banks and the other European banks. If you look at the rest, it has been stable or even slightly up. So basically, what we are observing when we say uh, a decline in banking flows globally is mainly an adjustment of inter-office positions done uh, by uh, inter-office cross-border positions done by European banks. And, and here it's very interesting because you isolate really what is driving this uh, peak in, uh, in financial globalization or even the decline. Uh, and the, the, the understanding is very important for policy purpose. Because if the other global banks are doing relatively well, it means that there, there was some adjustment in the European banking system. And we all know that before the crisis, there were a lot of exposures taken by European banks, uh, especially uh, to get dollar funding in the US. So this adjustment is I would say a natural consequence of uh, what has happened before the crisis. So it's an adjustment that you would expect after years of exuberance. And the second thing is that it's also something that is in line with the policy response after the crisis, because after the crisis we have set up Basel III and we are asking banks either to reduce their assets or to put more capital. And basically what you see here is uh, significant deleveraging by European banks after, uh, after the crisis, which again, is not, oh, globalization is going down, there's something nasty going on, is a, a normal response to policy uh, decisions that were precisely aiming at having an adjustment in this uh, banking sector. So this was my last example to, to try to show that uh, it can be very useful to look at this, at this uh, new way of thinking uh, economic activity from a consolidated perspective. It's more a complement, but it can provide useful, uh, useful uh, insights. And uh, this is a BIS uh, in Basel, in the picture. Thank you.